Hi, my name is Emma Simone and I'm the minister in McAdam, Upper Mills and Boca Beck. I'm here today to share some prayers, scripture and a short message with you. So let us pray. As we gather to pray today, we remember all of those who are playing second fiddle and patiently waiting for their turn to receive food, justice, peace, safety, and clean water for reconciliation, for reunion with loved ones, for protection from the cold, for protection from abusive relationships, for relief from pain, suffering, and grief, for freedom from jail cells, degrading occupations, addictions, and depression, for the gift of healing, medicine, and health care. Generous God, we pray for justice and fairness for all who are considered second or pushed to the last in line. Gracious God, may we always remember that in your kingdom, the last shall be first and the greatest shall be servant. Amen. Reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. And so they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and you teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show deference to no one, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? And they answered, The emperor's. And then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. So this is an instance where the Pharisees and the political supporters of King Herod are coming together to plot to entrap Jesus. They're trying to get Jesus to say something that they can then report to Roman authorities and have the state of Rome act to end the ministry of Jesus. Roman taxes in occupied territories were oppressive to people on the ground, and many of Jesus' followers were experiencing extreme poverty because of Roman taxation. The question asked is designed to have one of two outcomes. If Jesus says that it is against Jewish law to pay taxes, then they can tell this to the Roman authorities and he'll be arrested. If he says it is lawful, then his followers who are angry about the Roman occupation may desert him. The later may have happened to an extent because if we remember the fullness of the Holy Week narrative, when asked whether to release Jesus or Barabbas, who, had an, who was in an unflinching in his quest to end the Roman occupation, the people choose Barabbas. But Jesus, nevertheless, tries to string a very thin line. He requests a Roman coin, and in providing it, the Jewish authorities show that they are complicit in the Roman economic structures, even as they are asking if it's lawful to pay the tax. He then looks at the coin, notes that the Roman figurehead is upon it, and says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. More importantly, he says, give to God what is God's. And over the years, what Jesus means when he says this have been given various interpretations. One is that if we are to give to Caesar what is in Caesar's image, and we were created in God's image, then Jesus is once again calling on us to give our whole lives towards his ministry. Another is that this is a further reminder not to idolize wealth, but to be willing to give it all away in order to be closer to God. And still others have used this passage to justify the two authorities model, where the church and the state are to be completely separate. And this is where the idea that politics should not be discussed in church comes from. I don't prescribe to that, as anyone who listens to me regularly knows. But the reason that I don't prescribe to it is because I feel that we are all called to move our communities towards being the kingdom of God. Divine kingdom building is for the here and the now, not just for the hereafter. And just as those followers of Jesus were faced with whether or not to pay taxes to a government that was oppressing them, 
we are called to respond to policies and systems of our own government. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. summarized how Christians throughout time have discerned when they are called to act and when they are called to obey secular laws in his letter from a Birmingham jail. Within it saying, you express a great deal of anxiety over our willingness to break laws. This is certainly a legitimate concern. Since we so diligently urge people to obey the Supreme Court's decision of 1954, outlawing segregation in the public schools. At first glance, it may seem rather paradoxical for us consciously to break laws. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? And the answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. And conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Now, what is the difference between the two? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares within the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in terms of St. Thomas of Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is rooted in internal law and natural law. Any law that uplifts her human personality is just, and any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. Segregation, to use the terminology of the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, substitutes an I-it relationship for an I-thou relationship and ends up relegating persons to the status of things. Hence, segregation is not only politically, economically, and sociologically unsound, it is morally wrong and sinful. Paul Tillich has said, that sin is separation. Is not segregation an existential expression of man's tragic separation, his awful estrangement, his terrible sinfulness? Thus it is that I can urge men to obey the 1954 decision of the Supreme Court, for it is morally right, and I can urge them to disobey segregation ordinances, for they are morally wrong. Let us consider a more concrete example of just and unjust laws. An unjust law is a code that a numerical or power majority group compels a minority group to obey, but does not make binding on itself. This is difference made legal. By the same token, a just law is a code that a majority compels a minority to follow and that it is willing to follow itself. This is sameness made legal. And let me give another explanation. A law is unjust if it is inflicted on a minority that as a result of being denied the right to vote had no part in enacting or devising the law. Who can say that the legislature of Alabama, which set up that state's segregation laws, was democratically elected? Throughout Alabama, all sorts of devious methods are used to prevent Negroes from becoming registered voters. And there are some countries in which, even though Negroes constitute a majority of the population, not a single Negro is registered. Can any law enacted under such circumstances be considered democratically structured? Sometimes a law is just on its face and unjust in its application. For instance, I have been arrested on a charge of parading without a permit. Now, there is nothing wrong in having an ordinance which requires a permit for a parade, but such an ordinance becomes unjust when it is used to maintain segregation and to deny citizens the First Amendment privilege of peaceful assembly and protest. I hope you were able to see the distinction that I am trying to point out. In no sense do I advocate evading or defying the law, as would the rabid segregationist. That would lead to anarchy. One who breaks an unjust law must do so openly, lovingly, and with a willingness to accept the penalty. I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust 
and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the consciousness of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for law. In a 1984 United Church of Canada study guide on civil disobedience, it states, to be sure, Christians did not consider themselves above the law since they prayed for those in authority and they carried out all the practices of good citizenship. However, they drew the line by not confusing what belonged to Caesar and what belonged to God. Within the United Church, we understand that all are called to be concerned with peace and justice, but that some are called to a ministry of civil disobedience. We understand that role that civil disobedience has, has had in bringing forward injustices and placing them into the public sphere. For those who feel called to this work, there are several aspects to Christian civil disobedience. First, the motivation for civil disobedience has to be love. We are choosing to be unlawful not for personal gain, but to bring attention to an unjust law or policy. We are doing so because we love our neighbor. Second, one must be in control of oneself when putting themselves in a place where they will be treated as a lawbreaker. One must be willing to endure violence, imprisonment, and in extreme cases, death without seeking revenge. One has to be so fully encapsulated in the love of God that they are confident in their purpose and willing to endure injustice to lift up justice. Third, one's aim must be reconciliation. While in our opposition, we have an intention to change behaviors of our opponent, our aim can never be to destroy our opponent. Any action should be taken in a hope to appeal to the original good in the oppressor. And finally, prayer. We cannot be arrogant or enter into actions of civil disobedience with any type of superiority. Human action has always been subject to mistake and folly. We are not better than those who we resist. Prayer recenters us and calls us to continually discern if our actions are being done in a genuine and authentic hope to give to God what is God's. I wanted to speak to you about civil disobedience today because I have been continually concerned with the conflict over fisheries in Nova Scotia. I understand that some settler fishermen may feel that they are in the right, but I would implore them to recognize that violence, vandalism, sexual and physical assault, as is being reported by Indigenous fishermen and their supporters, are in no way tenants of civil disobedience. Supporting these actions in any way is not a Christian act. There is no reason for them. And I recognize these actions as being motivated by racism rather than a love of neighbor that God calls us into. Similarly, I wanted to highlight a new show that started on CHCO this week. If you're watching on TV, you can see it replay at 3 and 7.30 today. And if you're watching online, you can find it on the station's YouTube channel. It's entitled New Brunswickers Want Action. And in its premiere episode, it highlighted for me some of the unjust systemic barriers that we have here in this province that will need to be changed in order for this province to look a little bit closer to a kingdom worthy of our God. I recognize that anti-racism work is going to be an essential part of kingdom building going forward. And I recognize that it may call some of us to civil disobedience. And so I want to lift up and affirm that calling as being a Christian one and encourage those who feel called to take actions to do so, but to always do so in love, control, reconciliation, and prayer. May we continue to be both active citizens and committed Christians. May we give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God. Amen. Let us pray. Creator God, liberating spirit, risen Christ, we join our hearts with your people everywhere as we remember all who are oppressed and the prophets who advocated for them. We join our voices with all the saints who have journeyed the way of love before us and all those who take up the work of peace and justice within our time. We pray for victims of violence, and we pray for those who create violence. 
We pray for the victims of uncaring systems, and we pray for those who benefit from those systems. We pray for this fragile planet, and we pray for those who wound it. Let this week be holy. Let this time be filled with grace and mercy. Let this space be a sanctuary for those who are in pain and a cradle for the birth of hope and faith and love. And let our time of worship always bring us closer together and closer to you, Eternal One. We gather all of our prayers, spoken and unspoken, together and we lift them up to you. Amen. Amen.